Thank you very much to the organizers for allowing me to put some of the data that we've seen over the years in perspective. And I want to remind you, this is not easy to follow up on one of the most important presentations in colorectal cancer in recent years. Uh, just to paraphrase some of the things, we've never seen a survival benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.52 in the history of colorectal cancer therapy. So we'll talk about initial management of metastatic colorectal cancer in 2019, and I want to go back to some debates, historic debates on first-line treatment. Where were we? What dominated debates, let's say, 20 years ago, 30 years ago? <coughs> so in 1990, the first-line debate was, what's a modulator of 5-FU? And we talked about infusion versus bolus 5 You actually dug into the database, and I remember this review article by Alberto Sobrero, actually the first paper I read by, by, written by Alberto, talking about 5 of you in colorectal cancer, a tale of two drugs, implication for biochemical modulation, and he talked about bolus versus infusion of 5 of you. Since when we have come to the discussion about oxaplatin-based therapy versus renotecan-based therapy, and you know, this is almost like a religious war that we fought about first-line therapy, as long as these drugs were not generic. As soon as they turned generic, we didn't care anymore. And similar phenomena is now seen between bevacizumab, cetuximab, panitumab discussion. We've laid this more or less to rest because our challenge right now is to identify how should we treat patients, how do we individualize treatment options for patients, first line, second line, third line, giving all these relevant treatment options we have. And in the United States, of course, and I'm giving this talk from the perspective of the United States to some degree, PD-1 antibodies are part of our mix. Now, the goal of medical therapy, metastatic colorectal cancer, and I focus on palliative therapy, not potentially resectable liver metastasis, is finding the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. And of course, it's clear that one size fits all does not matter anymore. This is not the right way, and we've recognized it. We've gone away from empiric therapies, every patient gets the same treatment. Although I can tell you in clinical practice, especially in community settings in the United States and elsewhere, there are still some default regimens that are probably overutilized. And I can also tell you, in my opinion, I've seen this, I've said this many years, individualized therapy in colorectal cancer did not start with KRAS. What we're really looking at various factors influencing treatments in metastatic colorectal cancer, not just first line, but also second and third line. We look at patient characteristics. We do treat patients differently based on comorbidities, age, prior treatments, performance status, prior toxicities, but then tumor characteristics, including sightedness, goal of therapy, molecular characteristics, of course, which take up a lot of our discussions right now, which are not necessarily always the most important determining factors in patient preference. Of course, genomic markers, again, this has dominated a lot of our discussions, and I like what we heard earlier today, that we focus a lot on the tumor markers and have ignored the immune modulatory phenomenon in the immune system interacting with the cancer. That's the second part of our equation that we need to fulfill. But right now, more and more, we see upfront testing with NGS profiles. We are able to identify patients and dissect the spectrum of patients based on their molecular profile. So from the US perspective, the current treatment plan in the United States is really throwing a lot of what I just said overboard. And for Fox bevacizumab, it indisputably the most commonly used regimen in this, regardless of sightedness, RAS and BRAF status, the default that physicians use. For theory, bevacizumab mainly in academic centers, and in the United States, the use of EGF septa antibodies is slowly increasing in left sided RAS, RAF, wild type tumors, rightfully so, and this is where the United States lags behind Europe. In BRAF V600D mutant cancer, so far based on ESMO guidelines and Japanese guidelines, etc., we've looked at a triplet plus bevacizumab as an option, but it's not very commonly used, and after TRIBE 2, what you just heard, we have to reconsider that, and I don't know whether the ESMO guidelines will have to at least put an asterisk in there. We do have trials for MSR high IO therapies in first line, but also outside of clinical trials, IOs are used in frontline therapy, and HER2 is not yet exploited. So this is my table of choices that I think
is available right now in first-line therapy. And you see my preferred indication. This is my statement of how I would use these uh, regimens. And you know, the activity of these regimens is as low as fluoropyrimidine plus minus bevacizumab to a triplet plus EGF sub antibody. And I'll walk you through some of those. First of all, keep side with bevacizumab. That is, I think, a very underutilized first-line option Although it is very appropriate for some patient with low volume disease, smoldering disease, an elderly patient, a great and very important study, the ADEX study from the UK, looked at elderly patients over 70 years of age, randomized to capecitabine plus minus by a study that could never been done in the United States because everyone's defaulting to Folfox, but it showed that the interaction, the synergism between fluoropyrimidine and bevacizumab is something we can utilize. So on the other spectrum, we have EGF sub antibodies, and we have learned that left-sided tumors, RAS, RAF, Walter tumors, actually benefit a lot from, these, uh, from use of EGF sub antibodies, and do recognize as a statement that ESMO allows the use of EGF sub antibodies in right-sided tumors when you want to response rate, which is controversial and not adopted in the NCCN guidelines. You've seen the data from the CRISPR study, from the PRIME study, and from the 8405 study, that left-sided tumors, RAS, RAF, wild type, benefit from the use of EGF sub antibodies, but right-sided tumors do not, even though in the 8405 study, the potential detriment of the use of cetuximab in right-sided tumors was not statistically significant. But there's this consensus, left-sided RAS, RAF, wild type tumors re respond to EGF sub antibodies, and they should preferably use be uh, receiving cetuximab or panitumab added to chemotherapy backbone like Fosfox and Fosfiri. And this really identifies for me the perfect candidate for EGF sub antibody therapy, RAS selection, BRAF selection outside of the what beacon data that you just heard, potential HER2 amplification, there's a question mark on that, and further exclusion criteria, which are not mutually exclusive right-sided tumors. We know much better now than, let's say, five to eight years ago who these patients are who should receive EGF sub antibodies in first line therapy. And in those patients here, yeah, I think it's the default and should be standard of care. Now, what about triplet regimens? And I personally believe triplet regimens, Folfox theory, are underutilized. We've seen data with Folfox theory, bevacizumab, and have seen those data for quite some time. EGF sub antibody addition to triplets has been kind of there were some caveats around it. We believed it might be too toxic. But you've already seen data today from Tribe 2, very interesting data showing that the primary endpoint of secondary progression free cell, the spectrum of first line and second line reintroduction therapy, was positive for a triplet plus bevacizumab. Um, even though the main emphasis was really the first part of this sequence, not the second part of the sequence. But even in the tribe, initial tribe analysis, and I'm not focusing on BRAF mutant tumor discussion, but it was clearly shown by Dr. Cremolini that right-sided tumors, which we know have a poor prognosis, actually benefit from a triplet combination plus bevacizumab, and left-sided tumors might not need a triplet, actually they can get away with a doublet. So bottom line, whatever we see, right-sided tumors, poor prognosis, potentially BRAF tumors, poor prognosis, if we choose a chemotherapy regimen, we might be able to default to a triplet. So what about, um, and we've seen the same idea about aggressive tumors with the presence of circulating tumor cells in the very elegant uh, study recently presented at ASCO from the TTD study group in, in Spain, looking at those patients who have uh, more than three circulating tumor cells at baseline, that those patients actually benefit with a primary endpoint from the use of a triplet plus bevacizumab compared to a doublet. Common denominator here is aggressive tumors need more aggressive therapy. Poor prognosis tumors might be better off when you treat them with a triplet, triplet plus bevacizumab. So what about combination with an EGF sub antibody? And there's emerging data here, a study from, from Germany, the Folfi study looking at Folfox theory plus panitumab compared to Folfox theory alone without panitumab, that those uh, drugs actually, those regimens actually um, uh, tolerable, number one. Number two, highly effective. Here, when you look at the middle part of the, of the uh, uh, bar graphs here, left-sided tumors, RAS, RAF, wild type, treated with falfoxiri, panitumab, a response rate of 91%. 91% in metastatic colorectal cancer. This 
smells like lymphoma, it's still colorectal cancer. And uh, the overall survival data are quite encouraging, but I want to highlight here that even in this more aggressive treatment up front, the BRAF mutant tumors in this setting only had about eight to nine months median survival. Admittedly, this is a smaller study, less than 100 patients, but it shows you where we can get to if we want to optimize response rate. And we want to optimize response rate in the context potentially of conversion therapy and in contrast to what I said earlier that I will focus on palliative setting. If you really want to utilize high response rate to make, uh, make tumors resectable for potential long-term NED situations, you know, triplets are part of the equation. And I, again, I believe triplets are under underutilized. So, where do we go from here? And this is more or less standard of care, but I can tell you that the next couple of slides that I'll show you are already becoming standard of care in select centers, and in, in, in my hands particularly too. First of all, MSA high colon cancer. First of all, we also know that MSA high colon cancer based on data from 8405, the CLGB-SWOC study, seemed to benefit more from a bevacizumab-based chemotherapy regimen than cetuximab-based chemotherapy regimen. And that's actually consistent with some other data we have, even the adjuvant setting. MSA high tumors seem to respond better to anti-vegetative therapy. Now, otherwise, of course, we have the I.O. era of pembrolizumab, nivolumab, nivolumab plus ipilimumab. We have a lot of data in a salvage therapy setting, non-randomized data, and we have emerging data in first-line setting, including the data from Checkmate 142, which I think are very interesting and have shaped my clinical practice actually outside of clinical trials. Nivolumab, ipilimumab, only 45 patients, but when you see a waterfall plot like this in first line, you, of course, you think that's very interesting, very interesting response rate. Of course, you worry about the hyperprogressors, which, or potential hyperprogressors, which we need to identify. I think we need to learn from these patients to really see what is going on and learn tumor immunology from these patients. But more importantly, when you see the time-related endpoints in the study, the progression-free survival curve, the overall survival curve, you see the months of you know, curves kind of teetering on the top of this bar or of this graph, that is something you cannot achieve with chemotherapy. And while we do not have randomized trials yet, there's an ongoing trial in the United States from the intergroup comparing atezolizumab, a PDL1 antibody, to chemotherapy or chemotherapy plus bevacizumab plus atezolizumab. And we also don't have the data of the first line trial, Keynote 177, which is critical, particularly for countries in Europe that do not have yet have access to IO therapy in, in MSI high tumors. We don't have these data yet, but in my clinical use, if I have a patient with an MSI high colon cancer and I don't have a clinical trial available for them to put patients on, I use a combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab in my clinical practice. Now, you just saw the data of Beacon. Of course, we have the problem of BRAF mutant colorectal cancer, which we highlighted many times. Poor prognosis, relatively common in about 10% of patients. Very distinct gene expression profile, very poor prognosis as outlined before. And now we have the Beacon data that are really shaping standard of care. You saw this just recently an overall survival delta here, which is quite impressive, with a non-chemotherapy regimen, a hazard ratio of 0.52, almost doubling of survival in a second and third line setting with very nice waterfall plots where you know that standard of care in a second line therapy for serious cetuximab base is only associated with 2% response rate. This, of course, screens for the use in first-line treatment. While I have not done this yet in my routine clinical practice, Dr. Gill already mentioned the ANCHOR study, which is ongoing and will hopefully show efficacy in a non-randomized comparison of this triplet biologically designed regimen in a first-line setting and can hopefully help us improve outcomes for patients in this very otherwise very poor patient population. Track and track could be part of the mix. I, we, at my institution, we have screened all patients at diagnosis for uh, with whole in, uh, exon sequencing and uh, to whole transcriptomes to identify these patients. And we have approved agents like larotrectinib. It's very difficult for me to see if you have waterfall plots like that in the durability, the documented durability of response, that in this very select patient population, you would not use larotrectinib in first-line therapy, which is not the way it's approved. 
but I could imagine that this will move into our clinical practice in first line very soon. So conclusion individualization of first line treatment is warranted based on various factors, including mutation in the status, sightedness, treatment goal, prognosis, patient disposition, etc. I do believe that triplet combination, as I said, plus minus antibodies are underutilized. Targeted therapies beyond VEGF and EGF septa inhibitors are moving into first line, as you've seen. Thank you very much.